further ado, I welcome Takumba, who is with SI Bone and Joint, and she will make introductions. Thanks again for being here tonight. Yes. Hi, everyone. How are you? Good. First and foremost, thank you so much for agreeing to spend your Thursday evening with us. I know you could be somewhere else, probably taking a nap right now from a busy day of work, but you guys have agreed to come. So thank you again. My name again is Takumba Gandhi. I am the field marketing specialist with SI Bone, and we are a medical device company. Um, we specialize in a minimally invasive surgery um, that helps patients who have SI joint pain. We know that physical therapy is a key part of this process and helping these patients with this debilitating condition. So um, we really partner with you. Um, today we have Scott Gassonian, who is our PT consultant. He'll be covering um, part of the presentation on the clinical um, diagnosis and examination of SI joint pain. And we have one of our trained surgeons, Dr. Hennessy, who will you know, um, talk more about um, iFuse implant system. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna just introduce Dr. Hennessy, and then Scott will take over from there. Thank you again for having me. A nice Thursday night as well, uh, after, our, after our miserable winter. Uh, I'm a snowmobiler. The winter is terrible for me. The, uh, uh, my name is Ryan Hennessy. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I practice mostly in Elmhurst, uh, a little bit in Gottlieb, uh, not out here. So while, and I was uh, trained at Northwestern, uh, went to Rush. So all my training was at Rush. I went 10 years there. I knew every stairwell, which stairwell, which door opened on which uh, floor for 10 years there. Uh, then I came to practice in the west suburbs, and I've been there since. I, I, I was chairman of surgery at Elmhurst, so part of the Elmhurst Edwards system out here in Naperville, but to be honest, honestly, I don't come out to Edwards. So we got to, one thing we do have to work at Elmhurst is try to, and Edward has to work in return, is we have to bridge our alliance a little stronger. But thank you for having me, in a, and, and I've ma made the evening available, so I'll be available for questions uh, afterward for as long as you like, okay? Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Scott Gitsoyan. Um, I've been a practicing clinician for 12 years now. There we go. Um, I graduated from Northern Illinois University with my master's, uh, University of St. Augustine in Florida with my transitional doctorate. And my most recent accomplishment is my Doctor of Health Science just this past April. So um, I have a manual therapy certification. I'm an orthopedic clinical specialist, and I'm a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapists. I work out of present St. Joseph Medical Center in Joliet at our Neuroscience Institute. It's an outpatient clinic and about 70% uh, of our caseload is spine. Um, so one day, about three or four years ago, I went to eat lunch and we had a representative from SI Bone there and she was talking with our neurosurgeons about the IFU system or the um, sacroiliac joint fusion. Um, and it's just like in physical therapy and in medicine, People have different understandings with the SI joint and they have different ideas of, of where they think treatment should lie and, and, and the SI joint. Uh, so it was pretty apparent as the rep was going on that I was having more of a conversation with the rep than the surgeons were. Um, so as we left, the rep came up to me and said, you know, would you, would you mind being a consultant for our company? And at first I thought, no, I don't really want to. You know, my role is more in the conservative management of the spine. And, um, although I do see people post up, I want to try, if I can, to prevent surgery. So I kindly gave her my business card and walked on. And a couple weeks later, I got a call saying, do you think you'd like to be a, a representative of our company? And I said, well, let me take a look at it. So I, I looked into the company, and I was, I was actually pretty impressed. I looked at their al algorithms and their protocols and how they diagnose the problem in which patients they decide to have surgery and which patients they don't. And it was more evidence-based than I had seen out of any medical company in a while. Uh, so I said yes, and now three years down the road, I'm so happy to be here. I'm a paid consultant at SI Bone. Uh, the other reason I like the company is that they do quite a bit of research on their devices. Um, sometimes other companies just put out random information or, or, or very not very good research, but SI Bone is, is very into putting out good quality research, and they actually promote conservative management first before even attempting surgery. So, okay. Um, let me hear about you guys. Where do you guys all practice? Is it more outpatient setting, inpatient, rehab? Where are you guys from? Rehab. rehab? Mm -hmm. Outpatient. Outpatient? Okay. Outpatient. Outpatient? Okay. Do you see a fair bit of people with spinal type problems then? Okay. Good. Good. 
Um, any women's health specialists? One? Okay. Um, how many people treat the SI bone on a regular basis? Quite a bit. Okay, good, good. Okay. Um, so today we're going to talk about the SI joint as far as clinical examination, diagnosis, and treatment. And Dr. Hennessy is going to talk about uh, the IFU specifically. We're not going to talk or go into much depth about specific treatment techniques or exercise just because of the lack of evidence and the many confounding schools of thought that we have. We'd probably be here forever debating back and forth. Um, so let me, start, let me start with a question. What percentage of low back pain do you think is actually caused from the structure in the lumbar spine? If you had to take a guess. What percentage? Throw out a number. Anybody? 60? OK. Yeah, that's actually pretty close. Um, what we find is it's about 65%, OK? Which means the other 35% is divided somewhere between the hip, the sacroiliac joint, and other various causes. If we look at the literature about the prevalence of SI joint pain, we find that it's about 20%, give or take. Which is important to know, because if I treat 10 patients in a week with low back pain, I should get about two of them that have an SI joint component, or the SI is the primary source of their pain. So if I have nine patients with SI joint pain, or I'm not seeing anybody, I'm not really in line with what the research shows. I have to kind of go back and, and look at my uh, diagnostics. Now that's in the general population with low back pain. If we take a cohort that's undergone a prior lumbar fusion, the incidence of low back pain or SI joint pain increases to 32 to 43%, which is pretty significant. So then out of your 10 patients, if they've had a prior lumbar fusion and now they come in with a new onset of pain in the future, 30 to 40% of those, three or four of them, sometimes maybe even five, will have the SI joint as a component of their pain. So if you're not looking at the SI joint with this population, we're probably missing something. So is that more of an adjacent segment syndrome? Where, where exactly. Well, the, um, the movement has to go somewhere, right? Yeah, we've it's known for a while. Yeah, exactly. You know, we've known for a while that you, know, you fuse a segment in the lumbar spine, five to 10 years down the road, you get adjacent segment degeneration, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we find that exactly the same thing happens with the sacroiliac joint. If you have a one level fusion, let's say L5S1, in return, you end up increasing the strain and the motion at the SI joint about 28 to 52%. Okay? A two-level fusion, L4 through S1, which is fairly common. I think I have one or two patients on my caseload right now. You increase the strain at the SI joint 68 to 168%. So it's no wonder these people come in down the road with SI joint complaints. Mm -hmm. okay? um, so I really like anatomy. I find that nobody else really does. So we'll go through this. We'll talk about just kind of what's pertinent <coughs> as far as understanding the joint itself. Uh, so both the ileal and the sacral surface have these irregular depressions and ridges that match or oppose the same ridges and depressions on the opposite side for stability. Also, you have the general concavity of the sacrum that matches the convexity of the ilium for stability. If we look at the articular surface of the sacrum, um, it's articular cartilage or hyaline cartilage, just like any other synovial joint that moves. If you look at the ileal surface, we have fibrocartilage, just like the intervertebral disc for compression. So if we take a look at the anatomy of the joint, it really tells us what the joint does in its function. It facilitates small movements, and it absorbs and transmits loads from the trunk and the lower extremities. So yes, the SI joint does move. We have multiple studies that show it does move. It is a triplanar motion. The majority of the motion happens with sacral nutation or counter nutation, which is the same thing as a, um, ileal posterior anterior rotation. It's not much though. In males, it's about one to two degrees. In females, two to four degrees. So it's a good thing that's not its primary focus, but yes, it does move. So the main thing the SI joint does is it transmits and transfers forces across the SI joint. Uh, so if we talk about an integrated model of how this works, we mainly refer to Panjabi's three components of functional stability. You have the passive stabilizing system, which are the osseous and ligamentous components, active stabilizing system, such as the muscles, and the neuromuscular system. So if you go back in history and you look at some of the 
old monuments constructed by masons, they had a lot of archways where they would have um, a keystone in the middle. The archway would come up and it would start to, to come across and they had a wedge-shaped keystone that would come in the middle. So this would basically, you have the gravitational force of the keystone which mass matches the ground reaction force of the columns and you create stability for the segment. Well, we have the same thing in the body. You have a wedge-shaped sacrum and unlike this, you have two ilium, two ilia, where it kind of comes down and creates stability through the whole system. What also happens is when the sacrum is seated between the two ilia, it creates tightening of the ligaments around it. So we call this form closure. It's the form of the structure that creates stability for the, for the whole area. Force closure has to do with the muscles. When we talk about stability of the trunk, um, you know, we, we always talk about the core muscles, which rightly so, they're very important, specifically the transverse abdominis and the multifidus. Um, what we don't talk about is kind of the anterior, or I should say the superior and the inferior aspects. Um, every women's health specialist knows the importance of the pelvic floor musculature, not just for continence, but also for the stability of the trunk, and also the diaphragm superiorly. So what I think is going to happen in the next decade or so, I mean, we still have a lot of research to do overall, but I think you can see some of these other muscle groups getting more attention that we haven't really focused on too much yet. So the other group are the more general muscles, the, the global muscles, uh, ones that sometimes when we talk about core stability, we kind of forget about. Um, but yes, we have a latissimus dorsi for a reason, and we have these other muscles. Uh, they actually play a part as well. So Andre Vleming, if you go back and look at his work, he was an anatomist, and he looked at the fiber orientation of some of these muscles in the back. And what he found was the contraction of these muscles and the fiber orientation going through the thoracolumbar fascia can actually create stability for the whole system. So if you have the latissimus dorsi going through the thoracolumbar fascia and the contralateral gluteus maximus creates tightness in that plane. Now if you contract the same on the other side, you create tightness right in the middle, just like when you have crisscross shoes and you go to tie them, okay? He calls these muscular slings, okay? And there's many of them there. If you want to look more into them, it's Andre Vleming's work. But basically it goes to show you that the core muscles are vitally important for stability of the back, but also are these global muscles too. We have to pay attention to the whole system. So here you can see this is an anatomical picture, and here's the drawing of the fiber orientation. So for instance, you have the paraspinal muscles, the fiber orientation up here, going through the thoracolumbar fascia, and the TFL down here. Here you have the latissimus dorsi and the gluteus maximus all in the same direction. Now it's also the timing and the sequencing of these muscles, not just the amplitude of contraction that we have to worry about. We know that with people with low back pain, we have delayed timing and altered, altered patterns of these muscles. So it's also the neuromuscular aspect that we have to work on as well. So when we take a look at the sacroiliac joints, uh, we have four main components. First, we take a look at components of the subjective history to help, up, help us with our diagnosis. Positive provocation testing, which we'll get into a little bit more. We need a positive response to intraarticular injections, which we don't see or deal with as much in therapy, but it's important to understand its purpose. And we also need to rule out as many other causative factors as we can from the lumbar spine and the hip. Because as you'll see, they're very close in relationship and many times they go hand in hand. So first is kind of a history. When and why did the pain start? Um, it can be from a gradual onset, such as laxity of the sacroiliac joint. So if we take an example of maybe a high school female in gymnastics. I say female because females are more prone to SI joint problems than males. Uh, so a female gymnast in high school, they spend a lot of time, they get a lot of flexibility and core strength in their, in their, in their regime, right? What happens down the road, maybe after high school or college, they don't have the same intensity of their workout, or maybe they're not even involved in gymnastics. Um, they take a desk job, like nobody here has patients that take desk jobs, right, and sit all day. Mm -hmm. um, well, when you do that, they're not using those muscles as much, right? You still have the flexibility, the mobility, but now you've lost the strength. So you have a lot of extra laxity there. 
or pregnancy as well. We know with hormonal changes from oxytocin and relaxin that you have increased laxity of these ligaments. So down the road, you see, like I said, more women than men, uh, but men as well, in their 30s, 40s, and 50s in this area, starting to develop SI joint problems. Also from repetitive forces, any type of manual or, or repetitive movement that can strain through the area, <coughs> Bio biomechanical abnormalities, such as leg length discrepancies, scoliosis, where you're putting extra or abnormal torque through the area. You don't see iliac crest bone grafts as much anymore. And a big thing like we talked about is adjacent segment degeneration after a lumbar spinal fusion. <clears throat> so that should be somebody, if you have somebody coming in with low back pain, if they've had a prior lumbar surgery, make sure you know what type of surgery and where it was, because that's pretty key to understanding this area and how likely it is to be a sacroiliac joint. It can also be from a traumatic onset, such as a motor vehicle collision. So if somebody has their foot on the pedal, the acceleration and deceleration will drive a posterior directed force through the femur and eventually through the SI joint as well. Also a slip and fall. Many times people fall directly onto the ischial tuberosity and that just sends a force right up through the SI joint. I think those are the two main ones. You also see problems after lifting and twisting injuries, um, but that can be a lot of other problems too. Um, that's half of our patients with, with discogenic pain as well, after the first snowfall, which we didn't get this. <coughs> well, we had one, that was about it. Or uh, various traction injuries. Okay. So this is the pain referral pattern for the sacroiliac joint. The majority of the time is going to be below L5. 94% of the time it's going to be in the buttock area. 14% of the time in the groin. But it can also go into the lateral thigh and the lateral lower leg. We used to think that many times if it went down below the knee that it had to be a radicular type problem, but that's not true. The sacroiliac joint can refer pain down there as well. So here are the patterns, and it, it gives us an idea of where this joint can refer pain, but it, it doesn't give us enough to really diagnose it. As you can see, there's probably a bunch of other diagnoses that we can think of that had the same referral pattern. What do you guys think? Can anybody think of one off the top of their head to put you on the spot? What else has the same pattern here? piriformis type syndrome, yeah. glute medius, trigger points in that area, L5 radiculopathy, IT band syndrome, uh, trochanteric hip bursitis. I mean, we could probably go on, right? So you can't use this specifically for diagnosis, but it gives us an idea of where the pain would be located at. Items that exacerbate SI joint pain. The biggest thing is unilateral weight bearing which is pretty important because the majority of the gait cycle is single leg stance, okay? So this is your patient. If they have a right SI problem, they're gonna have a short stance time on that right hand side. They're not gonna put, wanna put weight on there very much. Also sitting, this is your patient that when they're sitting, they're gonna take weight off the affected side. So they're gonna be leaning on the other side, basically. Also pain with transitional movements because the joint transmits loads back and forth, these people have problems with bed mobility rolling in bed, transfers of sit to stand, and items like that. And not all the time, but also pain with stationary positions for periods of time. Just like that instability type moment we mentioned with the, with the female athlete. Um, you get instability type symptoms from the sacroiliac joint as well. So it makes sense that if it's gonna exacerbate those symptoms by weight bearing on the affected side, it's gonna take the pressure off by unloading that side whether that's standing on the unaffected side, sitting on the unaffected side, or sometimes even putting a belt around somebody for stability. Okay. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time on the lumbar spine or the hip, but I think it's really important to understand how related they are. Because uh, many times we have concomitant problems and we have to pick out when the SI joint is the problem. Uh, so like I said, you can have pain in the lower leg or in the calf from the sacroiliac joint. The problem is sometimes that can mimic a radicular type symptom from maybe an L5 or S1 area as well. So it's really important with these patients to do a thorough neurological examination. Uh, myotomal strength testing, sensation testing, reflexes, and neurodynamic testing, or I forget the correct terminology, it changes every six months or so, uh, but nerve gliding as well. Um, for the straight leg raise and the slump test. Okay. Um, who's here is familiar with McKenzie method for low back? Quite a few people, okay. 
Um, you don't have to be a McKenzie practitioner to use it in practice to some extent. What we find is that, okay, so the McKenzie method is basically saying, is looking at end range movements. It can be flexion, extension, or other movements. The majority of the time in this case is going to be repeated extension. And what we find is if it's a discogenic type problem with repeated end range extension, that pain in maybe the lower leg will centralize towards the buttock or up towards the low back. And what we find is when that happens, the McKenzie procedure is actually better at differentiating discogenic low back pain than an MRI is. Okay? Um, so sometimes just including that in your examination can be important. They did a study where they took people with SI joint pain and they took a look at hip radiographs. They found that 76% of those people with SI joint pain had at least one abnormal finding on their hip radiograph from osteoarthritis, subchondral cysts, impingement, and other type issues. So it's the same thing we find in the lumbar spine with disc bulges. Depending on the study you read, 30 to 70% of people have a disc bulge at at least one level. Some people that have never had any back pain in their life, right? So the key is identifying which people have a symptomatic segment and which are just kind of a, something normal that we all go about our lives with. So the same thing here. Many people have also hip problems as well, but it's figuring out when is the problem actually coming from the hip and when is the majority of the problem coming from the low back. A couple tests that we can do to take a look at the hip. Um, the Faber test I like, well, first of all, because it's an acronym, so that helps me remember what it is. Uh, so you guys have probably heard of the majority of these, if not use them in clinical practice. So Faber is flexion, abduction, and external rotation with the patient's leg. And basically, you take them out to the side. We'll do this in lab in just a second. We're going to go through some of these, some of these tests as well. The reason I like this one is because it actually differentiates the location of pain. If you look in the research, it's used to differentiate the lumbar spine if they have pain in the low back, the SI joint if they have pain at the PSIS, or even the hip if they have kind of a, a deep pain in the hip or even the, the anterior part of the joint. So it's used as a special test that can also help you differentiate where the problem is at. The scouring test we use for hip arthritis or other pathologies such as labral tears where you bring the hip up to 90 degrees um, and you kind of press down and scour through the joint and any type of irritation or pain in that area would tell you that it's most likely a hip joint problem. The Fader test as well, an acronym for flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. Uh, this is done supine. It can test for labral tears and for impingement. The Fader test, which I think is ironic because it stands for the exact same thing, flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. But for this one, you usually have the patient in, in sideline. So this one is actually testing more the piriformis. So if you're getting irritation around the piriformis uh, area when you do this, it's telling you that it might be more the piriformis that's the cause of many of the symptoms. Okay. What I think is interesting is that the most predictive finding for hip arthritis is decreased range of motion, mostly in internal rotation. But just goes to show you some of the fundamental things that we do in part of our examination are some of the most important. We don't always need some, some extravagant special tests. Sometimes just the typical things we do is going to give us the most information. Uh, antiversion, I'm going to skip over here. Okay, so if you only remember a couple slides for today, this is one of them. The first one is probably the slide that talked about the prevalence of SI joint pain, and then this one. So Joseph Fortin is a surgeon out of uh, Indiana. He did a study a while back where he took a bunch of people with low back pain, and he said, point with one finger to the spot of their pain, to your pain. And he found time after time that the people with SI joint pain pointed within one centimeter of the PSIS. Okay? This study has been validated in, I think, 2008 or 2009 by a gentleman, Mirakami, out of Japan. And he found the exact same thing, only it was about two centimeters. Okay? So this is your patient that comes in, and you ask him, where is your pain? And they say, you know, it's, it's kind of in the buttock area and down here. But, you know, really, the main spot, I mean, it's, it's, it's right here. It's right here. That's your person with SI joint pain, okay? So we call this a Fortin finger test or the Fortin test, okay? If they point to directly at the PSIS as the source of their pain, you better start thinking SI joint, okay? Another thing you can use, uh, it works well, not quite as predictive, 
is the active straight leg raise just to test for pelvic stability. Anybody use this in clinical practice sometimes? Okay. Um, so you have the patient supine lift their leg about 20 centimeters, which is about seven or eight inches. Um, and many times if they lack stability around the pelvis, they won't be able to raise up the leg, or if they do, it's very, very painful. Then what you do is you stabilize through the hips or the SI joint or the pelvis, and they try it again. If they have less pain or they can do it better, then that's a positive test. Okay. Now I have a fairly manual or hands-on background. Um, and so as some of the literature comes out, it actually makes me kind of think about what I'm doing and if what I'm doing really makes sense or if I'm along the, same, the right lines. We do a lot of tests that we do to, to look at the SI joint or to see if the SI joint is a problem, such as uh, we palpate for landmarks, such as the malleolus or the ASIS and see if it's off or rotated. Uh, we palpate for motion mobility around the sacrum, which I still use in clinical practice. The problem is, time after time after time, research shows us that these tests don't have very good reliability or validity, okay? Doesn't mean stop them completely, but it means maybe we have to stop and rethink how we diagnose, how we treat, and how we look at this problem. And it was the same for the provocation test for the sacroiliac joint. Provocation test meaning a test that's going to irritate or cause pain in the area. Uh, so if you look back a couple dec decades ago in the research, it would show that the distraction test was not very reliable or valid. But if you look closer at the research, it looked at each test in isolation. But I mean, in clinical practice, when do we ever do that, right? It's like taking somebody with, with you know, numbness on the inner part of their thigh and saying, or lower thigh and saying, you know what, you have an L4 radiculopathy. You can't do that, right? Now, if you have an absent patellar reflex, if they're walking in with foot drop, you have a better idea that that's the problem but just based off of one test, you can't make that decision. So what we found in the research, though, is that if you have three or more positive provocation tests, you have the ability to rule in and rule out the condition of the sacroiliac joint with sensitivity and specificity values in the 70s, 80s, and 90%, just by having three positive tests or not having positive tests to rule it out as well. And now you back that up with the Fortin test and some other things, and you can improve it even further than that. And this is something that we can all understand. Um, from the medical profession to physical therapy, we train uh, pain doctors, nurse practitioners, we can all understand doing these tests. So it gives us a common language that we can use to talk about it, okay? Uh, so like I said, in the research it shows that you need three positive tests uh, to confirm or to have a high confidence that it's the sacroiliac joint problem. If you don't have any positive tests, you can be even more sure that it's not a sacroiliac joint problem, which is good to know because then you, you know, look further at the lumbar spine or the hip or other various causes, okay? So we're gonna do these in lab in just a little bit. There are more provocation tests than these, fine, than these five. Uh, we've picked these five because they've been shown in the literature to have the best predictive validity. Um, and they're easier to, they're one of the easier ones to perform, okay? Uh, just again, showing some of the trigger points in the area like we had alluded to that can also mimic SI joint pain referral patterns. Okay. Um, so a couple decades ago, we used injections to the SI joint to tell if, it's, if that was the, the problem or not. The problem then is we didn't use fluoroscopy guidance. We just kind of stuck a needle where we thought it would be and we hoped that that was where it should be. The problem that we found out is that we didn't always hit the joint and when we did, many times, you actually had fluid leaking out into the surrounding structures. Well, as you know, it's not always just the SI joint that is the problem, it's some of those surrounding tissues and structures as well. So we get a lot of false positives. Nowadays, we have fluoroscopy guidance with x-ray and CT scans, so we know if we put, it, we put an injection into a joint, if it stays in that joint or it leaks out. Um, so fluoroscopy guidance is actually the gold standard for the SI joint uh, diagnosis. I think it's actually more of a bronze standard, to tell you the truth. It has a very high false positive rate, um, but it's the best that we have, okay? So because of the high false positive rate, what we do is this. Typically, specifically for research purposes, in the clinic as well, um, you do two injections with different anesthetics, okay? So for the first time you have the patient in there, you might use an anesthetic like lidocaine 
which lasts two to four hours. So you'd expect when that person gets injected that they have significant pain relief of about two to four hours. Now we know that the SI joint isn't always all of the cause of the pain, but we want it to be at least about between 50 or 70, something up there as far as that percentage of their pain relief, okay? There's some debate in the research, but if you can get somebody with 75% pain relief from an injection, you're pretty sure that that's the majority of their problem, okay? So you get somebody, you inject lidocaine, and for about three to four hours, they have, let's say, 80% pain relief. Boom, you're pretty sure that's the problem. But what you also do next is because of the high false positive rate, they have to come back and get a second injection with a different anesthetic. Let's say bupivacaine, because we know that lasts about six to eight hours, okay? So what you want is that 75% pain relief with both injections, and you want the injection with the agent that lasts longer to give them greater pain relief than the shorter duration one. And that's how we diagnose it. So the reason I like uh, the SI bone company is, is the way that they diagnose and they determine if somebody's appropriate for surgery. Um, it, it's not like a couple decades ago where everybody you know, was a candidate for a lumbar fusion, um, which I think has gotten better along the way. How about now? <laughs> I'll give me that. Um, but what we do, we have a better system here. So for someone to get um, an implant, they have to have a positive Fortin test, they have to have three positive provocation tests, and they have to have 70 to 75% relief from two diagnostic injections, okay? And failed conservative management. At that point, we're pretty sure that that's the problem, and we're pretty sure that since they failed everything else, they're a good candidate for the surgery. Uh, the company is not trying to just spit out surgery after surgery. They're trying to pick out the best candidate for the best surgery. And Dr. Hennessy will show you in a minute some of the research that shows you the really into clinical outcomes. Um, you can also do a therapeutic injection. Um, you know, because if you have somebody in pain, you don't want the duration of their symptom relief to be four hours, right? You want it to last a little bit. So sometimes what you can do is also put a steroid in there, which lasts a little bit longer. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer to come on, but it has a longer duration. The problem with diagnosis, though, is that it's a little unpredictable. You don't know how much relief you're gonna get from it, when it's gonna kick on, when it's gonna come off. Uh, so typically what you want is a, an anesthetic injection, but you might see both in clinical practice. Okay, might be set there. Okay, everybody doing okay so far? Okay. So for treatment, basically, we start with the most conservative options and then move towards the most aggressive. So medications, physical therapy, injections, and if those work, you can even try a radiofrequency ablation of the nerves to the sacroiliac joint. If that doesn't work or it only lasts for a short duration of time and the patient just can't function, many times a sacroiliac joint fusion can actually help them quite significantly. But again, it's picking the right patient for the right problem. So we're all physical therapists in the room, so we're kind of biased towards physical therapy, right? Um, but basically it sums it up. Treating, the, the point of physical therapy is to treat the joint by returning it to its normal relationships. You want to restore normal mobility and stability to the whole lumbo, pelvic, and hip complex, right? Because we have the transfer of loads all the way up and all the way down. So what can we do to do that? Well, activity modification and education. Um, if these people are sitting a certain way all the time or putting repetitive forces through their body in maybe a way that they don't recognize or maybe in a work situation that they don't think they can change, maybe we can help them pick out different ways that they can do to help that. Um, stabilization and neuromuscular re-education. Normal muscle strength and length. And it's not just for the core musculature, but it's also those global muscles too, right? We have to take a look at those muscle slings. If you have a latissimus dorsi that's very, very tight, it's not gonna be able to function well and create good muscle force. So it's making sure you have muscle length and good muscle tension relationships. And also adjacent segment and joint soft tissue restrictions we have to look at, so manual therapy. So again, my background is very, very highly manual. Uh, so just to add a little bit of kindling to the fire, um, there's a study in 1998 by Tulberg where they put little metal tantalum balls, little metal indicators in the ilium and the sacrum. And they had therapists look at these patients and they looked at their landmarks and the ones that they thought were off or had SI joint problems, 
they manipulated them. Well, these patients, they gave them an x-ray beforehand and after and looked at where the kind of the position of these tantalum balls, which are very, very specific. They can identify, you know, to a tenth of a, a centimeter. I might be off on that a little bit, but basically what they found is that manipulation did not affect the position of the SI joint whatsoever. But what do we think sometimes? You have this leg longer than the other, and we manipulate you, and then it comes back, and you're better, right? Now, that's only one research article. Um, I'm sure there's twice as many going back and forth. But again, even me, it just it makes us stop and think, what are we doing and why? Are we actually changing the position or the relationship of these joints, or could it be something else? Is it a neuromuscular phenomenon? Is it a little bit of both? So I think we just have to be honest with ourselves and say, you know what? We don't know for sure exactly why some of these work, but they do work. So that's, I think, further area for research in the future here. Um, so manual therapy, balance, gait training sometimes, uh, because you're involving the glutes and other tissues that have a prime effect on balance as well. Or modalities for pain, um, if it's pretty pronounced. Okay. So I'm going to let Dr. Hennessy take over for a couple minutes and talk about surgical options for the sacroiliac joint. Okay, so now you put on your report plateau, you call me. Uh, Scott, uh, Scott's uh, uh, talk was pretty detailed and uh, the, uh, the diagnosis and the manipulation. And so I'm gonna just lump a few things. Number one, sacral electrode in my mind, um, uh, a few things that dovetail off what he said. Sacral electrode, the forgotten joint. Uh, for those of you older, if you remember the Three Stooges, they even used to make jokes about their sacral electrode. And it wasn't until the 30s and 40s uh, and, then, and then eventually the 50s with stenosis, that the disc became preeminent. And I can tell you that uh, even uh, my referring internists and family doctors, if a patient has back pain, it's from a disc. That's it. I mean, it, it really is so, it be, that, that thinking became so prevalent that the sacral joint was absolutely forgotten. And I, they, the, someone will have a bulge, and that is the cause, of a bulge on MRI, and that is the cause of their back pain. But, the, uh, but this, uh, then another dovetail of what he said is that this company is, uh, has done it the right way. Uh, I can tell you as a surgeon, when we get, uh, we get asked to meet with reps and companies all the time, you know, use my thing, use my thing. Uh, and most of it is me too, uh, you know, I, I, what I call me too. There, I mean, there's, there is no difference between the pedicle screw other than which rep you like best. There, really, there's not, there's no magic pedicle screw that is better than the rest, to be, to be quite honest. Um, now people can argue about the bone grafts at this point in the terms of spinal fusion. But the company, but SI, uh, th they've done it the right way. And I think you'll see in one of the slides, there's 25,000 cases. And I can tell you that's been over a decade, about a decade now. And so they're not, they're not out there just to slam metal. And they, they really, that's what was intriguing to me. The problem is, is to try to find those 25,000 cases because the SI joint is such a forgotten joint. And that's really why I think sometimes I've, when we've had our talks, uh, you chiropractors, I, can, I don't include DOs anymore because they've become MDs. <laughs> you know, they, I know almost no DO that it manipulates anymore. Um, so they, they do our residencies and they are us essentially. Actually, my partner's daughter just graduated DO school. She's becoming an OB-GYN, so uh, she, just, she just graduated a, a, literally a week ago. But, uh, so the, but the, the real neat part about this company is they they, they're very strict in their criteria. They, and this is early on. And remember, you have to really, when you, and I, I think it's important to take time for you folks who, who don't get the, you know, the onslaught of the reps that we do. The, this is really big money they're investing. I mean, when, and when they're a startup company, they would love to slam because they have investors and venture capitalists who they have to answer to. But this company did it the right way. And that's, that really speaks volumes to a surgeon, I can tell you that. Um, because, uh, you know, you know, the old saying, money talks. So they were very strict in their criteria. They wanted to do the right patients, not just any patient. And then they did the research to say, is this working and, and can we be better? And so I, I think they, I do give kudos. I'm not a paid consultant, so I can say that uh, openly. I, uh, so I'm here just because I enjoy talking about things and meeting people and, and discussing uh, medical topics. So 
anyway, the surgical treatment. So now you've wrote, you've you've manipulated, you've uh, treated, you've uh, uh, everything he said is, is what you guys do. <laughs> I'm a surgeon, uh, and now the, and they, and they say it hurts. Is it the right one? There we go. So this is uh, you can see, and this is this will be, uh, to my point. You can see the slides. Look at these: 26, 27, 27, 37, 2008. Right? I mean, there, you don't you didn't have some. You know, a decade, uh, every decade had some new progress with sacral effusion. That, that, look at these diagrams of, of the open fracture. Now, I, Edward is not a trauma center, uh, nor is Al Elmhurst, so we don't really see these, or typically don't see the major pelvis fractures. What, what's the trauma center out here? Is it, is it Edward? Good Sam. Good Sam. Good, oh, Good Sam, good that's right, Good Sam. Yeah. So you might, you might, so you might see uh, occasionally a fusion of the sacral like joint for in the trauma setting, but have any of you seen a sacral like fusion for in the degenerative setting? Not one. Okay. Uh, I mean, it, you're right because it isn't it isn't that common. Now, uh, this company really led the way about it starting a decade ago, and now there's about I think there's another slide about six or seven companies somewhere along the lines trying to truth be told be kind of glom on I think, but uh, but SI is uh, clearly a leader in this. So you can see basically uh, most of them were just open. You know, you hit the patient prone open up all the musculature. I mean, that's really what you're doing. And you're detaching all the musculature. So think of, think, go, go back, go, go to the spine, you know, a traditional big open spine fusion. You're taking the tendinous attachment of the central portion and stripping it and then holding the, that muscle open, which is, an, you know, anoxia, and then, you know, uh, per, uh, perform your surgery, but then putting it back. And that muscle itself was damaged during the surgery as well. If you get an MRI uh, of a big open spinal fusion, for the most part, you'll see the muscle looks different. It has a different signal pattern uh, compared to what we're doing more often uh, today. And then you see there was an attempt to try to make a little bit uh, smaller incision. And of course, you know, the I would say I'm not going to brag. I mean, mine's like about there, but uh, it's, you know, <laughs> it's it's like this big. But it's really it really is a small incision, but it's percutaneous. So you're splitting the muscle through its fibers and working then through the cannula which is important. So you're splitting the, similar to what we try to do in the spine uh, more often now. Um, you can see these are some of the other uh, companies. So SI Bone and there's, what, one, two, they, they listed five other companies. I'm sure there'll be about six or seven more uh, within the next couple of years. As, as this sort of gets rediscovered and uh, from the 30s, gets rediscovered and that, um, and, we, and we just don't write these patients off. A lot of things in medicine we write off because we don't have a, we don't have a good treatment option. And another example is vertebral compression fracture, and that's been in my career. I can tell you when I got a compression fracture consult at Rush when I was in residency, it was annoying. Like, why are they calling me? There's nothing we can do. They know there's nothing we can do. So I got to go up and trudge up to the floor and tell the lady there's nothing I can do, and here's your back brace, which they don't wear and they don't like, and there's no data to support it, and here's your pain pills, and here's your calcium, and then just follow up with your internist. And then the internist is mad because he was trying to dump it on us, and we just went, we, and we ping ponged it back. But the point being is we and and people thought, well, these are just something grandma and grandpa and grandpa get, and so there's not, and there's nothing you do for it. But therefore, it's really no big deal. Until one of the companies did some real research, and there was a real morbidity and mortality to it, which then and then of course de developed into is there a treatment for it? And of course, we you, you, I'm sure I guarantee you've seen kyphoplasty. Uh, uh, vertebroplasty and now a host of other companies, but sorry about other names, guys. But I'm not paid. Um, the, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, but the, but the point being is it was ignored because there wasn't much we can do, and I think the sacral joint has fallen into that in the latter half of the 20th century and, and, and now. So what are these implants? Um, the implants actually are more designed like our total hip and total knee or our cementless uh, implants we do predominantly for total hip. Uh, they're titanium implants. They're very light. I, uh, so, uh, but the point being is the the pores are what's uh, important. It tricks bone into thinking it's uh, other bone. So when you uh, when you put this cancellous bone through it, it wants to heal, right? It thinks it's broken. It releases all the cytokines that say you're broken. Start making new bone, and it grows into the uh, it grows into the implant. So the implant oh, is is a press fit, just like a total hip. So, there, so the initial fixation is actually the press fit, where you, the, the, the trocar is just a little smaller than the implant, and then you put the implant in. For those who do carpentry, you, you know, when you drill a hole for a screw, you don't drill the hole the size of the screw, you drill the hole just a little smaller so that the teeth can bite, right? 
And so this is the same, now these don't screw in, they literally just get hammered in uh, through a uh, cannula. But the point being is that the initial fixation is press fit, and then uh, and using two, uh, mostly three, sometimes in smaller patients it might be two, uh, to create a fixation. And then eventually the fusion is, uh, hopefully there'll be some adjacent fusion just from the damage you're causing uh, to the bone itself. But of course also the joint uh, growing into the implant on both sides of the joint, thus it doesn't move anymore. Now, there's 25,000 procedures, and this was, again, what Scott was talking about. The company really looks at the, uh, looks at the patients, and it, is it helping? And, and I think that's, uh, and that's really important, because, again, using sp uh, the spine fusion world, do I have to tell anyone that, that spine fusion rates or, or success rates are not as great as they probably, uh, someone's shaking their head over there. Right, I mean, really, the, the, that's, it's, it takes, I'm a spine surgeon, and I'm, doing fewer because as I get older I want to have patients smile a little more in my office and it's uh, it's not always it's 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 it takes a special person to do lots of them and have lots of patients who are less than satisfied shall we say so spine fusion and, and sometimes I you know we again using like when, what Scott says we, we believe it or not we really do think of what we do in, in medicine We're not, we don't just say what time do we have to go to surgery we actually think and you have to say to yourself are you know I is is, the, uh, is this uh, the, really the pathology that I'm addressing with this spine fusion? We think we are, but we really don't. And in this particular case with the SI, uh, there's, there are strict criteria that really try to get rid of it. Well, it could be, let's just try a fusion and see if it works and, and try to eliminate that uh, from the uh, protocol. So they, they really did study this. I have one question about this. Go ahead. See, like, when you do that surgery, you put the patient in a prone position. Mm -hmm. you do that? Yeah. And then how do you see when the patient is under anesthesia, when the muscle is not working, how do you decide what is the optimum position of the two bone? When you have three nail in there, it's not going to have any movement. So how, how do you decide you mean, the position we, uh, of, the, of the ilium and the sacrum to make sure this is the optimum functional position of the two bone? How, so, how do you decide that? So if I understand your question, essentially it's like if I had a broken wrist, make sure I'm not casting it with the wrist with the bone bent up still. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. it may, I'm, I'm putting it in the anatomic position? Correct. Well, the frame I use is a Jackson table, which it keeps tries to keep the normal rhythm. It's a so in other words, they're not flat. They're not on a flat bed like your bed at home. Uh -huh. um, you're, they're not laying flat. It actually has bolsters on the hip. Their their belly sags to cre recreate the lumbar lordosis, okay. and then there's a chest plate. Okay. So and then it's also very radio. It's very friendly for the uh, fluoroscopy because it's all it's almost all carbon fiber. So we can see things too. But the answer is, and number two, like he alluded to, th there is actually very little movement. It would be very hard for me to change the position. But, but to your point, the frame I use, particularly because of that point, is a Jackson table, which is a common table used in spine fusion surgery to help recreate the normal, in, for the same in the lumbar spine predominantly, to create the normal uh, lumbar lordosis, the normal position. So you're right, so we're not fusing in, in the fusing in abnormal positions, or like in the old days of spine fusion, with the old Andrews frames, or they are just bent over a Wilson frame, uh, when you had multi-levels, they were fusing people, what, flat back, right? So that, that in the lumbar world. But so, uh, but in this case, uh, almost all hospitals have, if not one, multiple Jackson tables now. Okay. Answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So the procedure itself is, is percutaneous. Actually, I'm looking on my fluoroscopy, I'm not, I'm hardly looking at the patient, okay, because the patient's draped. I have just a little window. Uh, they're prone on, the, as you said, on the Jackson table. And basically, the, the important thing is there's, there's landmarks, the fluoroscopy. Have you, you've mostly been in the OR, right? I'm sure in, during your training, you saw the fluoroscopy. We call it C-arm, because it is a C. It's live x-ray, and uh, that's, that's what we use for in the OR. You, there are fancy million-dollar OR machines, which are CT scan, but it really wouldn't add any benefit. Uh, to this. There are certain landmarks and you can see the uh, lines and you just follow your landmarks and you just basically put your guide wire in, uh, you make your incision, put your guide wire right through the muscle and then you just dilate to the, uh, uh, with a tube over the guide wire and, you, and now you're, you split the muscle and then you put the, you, you, once you dock to the bone, you're down on bone and then you work through that tube uh, and then, what, uh, then you basically, you know, there's a, it's a triangular uh, brooch uh, to put uh, to uh, make the uh, channel for the implant, you measure and then you implant. And the nice part is just a little technical thing uh, for fixation is, as you can see, like the, you try, you, you'll be very close at times to the uh, cortical bone, which is stronger. And because it's triangular, 
you can actually, you, you can rotate a little bit, try to get that flat area, it gives you a little extra fixation versus, let's say, a round uh, implant. There's a reason it's uh, triangular. Does anyone have any questions on this? And then the, uh, so to make them a little parallel, there is a, there is a we call it a double guide. So you put, those, you put your guide over one uh, wire, and then you, put your, you drill your second one through, and you just kind of, it makes it a lot easier, it makes it a lot faster. I have a question there. Yes. Um, what, what I know of spinal surgery, and I'm, I'm not a surgeon I'm sorry? at all, what I know of spinal surgery, you want to get the disc material out so that the, you get Correct. fusion from the top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Is it the same in this? Do you have to no. mess with that? Okay. No, and it's a good question. The, um, Number one, we're not, no, we're not actually putting bone graft in. The implant itself is what's going to lock the, the, the bone. So uh, here, so we're just using, can you see this okay? So actually, well, this one. So the, the, here's the joint, okay? So the, the cancellous bone growing there and the cancellous bone growing there, of course, with the cortical edges there is, is fixing. It's, lock, it's locked on both sides, right? Just like if I put a two-by-four across that door, that door is not going to open anymore. If I, if I put nails now into that, uh, if I put nails into the two by four on both sides of that door, that door is not going anywhere. Because it's Make still a seam, but it's not really going to move. Correct. Yeah. Especially when there's two or three implants. <coughs> okay. So he alluded there's lots of studies. I, it's late. It's warm in here, by the way. I'm sorry. I left my jacket off. It's pretty warm. Um, but it's, uh, there, there, there are plenty of studies. This, the, the company went through, really watches these folks and gathers the right data. And then uh, they want to make sure they're doing the right thing. And it seems to be, they're still around 10 years later, which in the startup world is amazing. For those of you, if, ever, if, I, if you've ever been involved with uh, the startup company, I spent a lot of time in Northern California. I spent a lot of time in the Bay Area since I was a kid. And it's kind of fun to go back now as an adult and try to. Help with, the, with try to and see the see the area and then also be involved in a few of these things. I've been fortunate to be involved in one or, uh, a couple, um, but it's so. But many of them fail. Most of them fail. They uh, or they get they, they they do. And if they're lucky enough to be on the verge of failure, they get bought out by someone. But uh, this this company this company is staying power, which says something. Okay, so the rapid pain relief, and I can tell you from my experience, it really is. The right patient with the right surgery does well. A unstable L4-5, and I don't mean just an L4-5 spondylolisthesis. I mean the ones that on flexion extension views move. You fuse them. That will be a happy patient. That, you know, they're not very common. Uh, we do a lot of fusions, but the ones that are really unstable on flexion extension, that's a happy patient. Um, and, and again, with, with all the other things that Scott said, their pain is uh, on the MRI and the radiculopathy matches on the MRI, their physical exam. Uh, it, it, that's the ones, that, those are the patients that you hope you could have a whole office fill, but unfortunately they don't. Most just have degenerative processes that aren't unstable and you think you have them. But you, you stabilize an unstable joint and uh, it, that's causing pain, that's a painful unstable joint. And I'm telling you, it's, it's amazing because, again, just like a hip replacement patient, more so than the knee, but a, just like a hip replacement patient, uh, when they've had really bad hip pain, I can tell you, they say, this, they, I mean, you know, 50% just say, well, it just hurts right now, doc. But if, I mean, you have a good percentage. You walk in the room even the next day, said, this pain's different. They, I, can, I can tell this is different. That other pain is gone. And uh, this is kind of a similar experience. Now, I don't know where they got crippled patients, because that's the, if you had a whole cohort of crippled patients, maybe you got to start hanging on the nursing homes. But, the, uh, but, uh, but I will tell you, it was uh, it, like one of my, uh, uh, my, my most, you know, they always have your star patient. And uh, mine was, yeah, I did, I diffused him. Uh, it was a work comp case. I think it was 4 5 and 5 1, or maybe just 5 1. Was he, yeah, he was just 5-1. So I fused 5-1, which doesn't have a lot of motion in and of itself. So, you know, not every level we think of the, the um, you know, you, like you said, you fuse one level and you transmit the forces down below, but they're not all equal. I mean, 4-5 has a lot more motion than 5-1, so it's not just a, it's not a simple little, uh, you divide, <coughs> divide the lumbar spine by 5. Uh, so I fused 5-1, and this guy was free. He's a work comp, remember, and we all know that work comp, there's, and I'm not saying this uh, to be funny, the studies are overwhelming in almost any diagnosis that, in general, they will do worse in, in terms of numbers of success than the standard population. And you can, figure, you can make your estimates why. The papers never say why. It's like one of those things we, that, you know, never, we, it's unspoken, but... But, the, but if they adjust for all other, uh, all other factors, like smoking, obesity, diabetes, whatever, um, you take a carpal tunnel population, you take an anterior cervical, you take a spine fusion, 
hip replacement, just name the diagnosis. If, it, if work comp is one of the factors, you'll, have prob you'll probably fall from 90% success rates to about 60, and that's pretty much across the board for almost all those diagnoses that I said. The lawyers have trouble. Well, this guy was a work comp, and, uh, but he was, again, he was finger on the SI joint. This hurts here. He didn't have much radiculopathy, maybe just a little in the hamstring, but it hurt right there. And he was just uh, he was just on the left side. That's it. I didn't have, he had a little on the right, but not a lot. Uh, we went through the protocol with him. It, uh, his injections were you know very temporary, but very but very uh, clear that they they made a difference in him. So we fused him, and of course now he's work up. And you know you hold you hold your breath when they come in in that first week visit, like. You know, and the typical work comp thing is actually usually the first week or two is pretty good. And then, like, as things are getting better and the nurse case manager showing up to when they could do light duty, then things start going south. Um, <laughs> and it, so, you, so uh, then it's like, you know, the pain's coming back. And uh, that's when you, you, you sort of brace yourself in that six week visit. Okay, you go in the room and you start, okay, we will go, let's go in the room. And uh, the shoe never dropped. And he was just the, all smiles. I, I, I just saw him. He's about, uh, Three, four months, three months, four months, um, out now. I mean, he just this, you know, boom, boom, you know, just right up, and uh, he's going back to a pretty heavy job. Um, it's amazing. So uh, it was, it was like it really. I mean, just the smile. It really, it, it, it just makes your day, especially when you have lower expectations because of the situation. Uh, but on top, you know, we all want to go to work and have people smile, right? I mean, it's, it, you know, I know there's, you know, it's, it's fashionable to say doctors out there are just to make money and all that. I mean, you know, I have kids in college. I want to make money. I'm not going to mince words. Um, I just put one through, one's in, one's almost done, one's going next year. And I still have a little guy in, in high school. So, um, you know, I mean, we have to put food on the table. That's, the, that's true. But, but the reality is, is now, now that I'm in my 50s, it's, you know, you want to go to work and you want to enjoy what you do, right? My, you know, my son was just out of college. He's went a little bit for the money, had a great education, made a little money. He's not quite as happy. I'm still finding it. So I said, you're young. You don't have any dependents. Go do what you want to do. And I promise you, you'll, you'll, in the end, you'll probably make just as much money anyway because you'll be loving what you do. So, uh, so and he didn't listen to me. He's doing for the money right now. But he'll, he'll change his mind. But the point being is we want to go to work and we want to enjoy what we do. I mean, and it's very trite. You know, our, all our parents probably told us, you know, go to work, uh, you know, do what you like and you'll never work a day in your life, right? And, um, but, uh, but the reality is it, it is very satisfying, um, especially in medicine, because it is about people, right? I mean, it's one thing to sell a hundred, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure when a screw sales, and I'm not putting it down, I mean, we need screws, right? But, you know, I just sold a case of screws, you know, to that client, you know, and that's exciting, and that's good, and that's when we need that. But there's something different when you can take someone who's really debilitated and make their life better. I mean, there, there really is, and that, that we, are, we are blessed. We sometimes forget about it, and especially in this current climate of medicine, but we really are blessed to be able to do that sometimes. Um, so the patient satisfaction, pick the right patient, have the right treatment, and patients get better, right? If you treat a pneumonia with the right antibiotic, they get better, if they move on, they're satisfied. If you just throw, uh, you're not sure what's going on, and you're trying a bunch of treatments, they're called shotgun medicine, and they, um, then, you know, they may or may not get better, they may not be as satisfied. Um, Post-op, this is more for, more for you folks. Okay, so age, weight, bone quality. So, you know, my, my guy had great bone, so good fixation, right? So, again, think fracture fixation patients, uh, think spinal fusion patients, right? Uh, versus, you know, so you want bone quality is key, right? If you, you're, we're basically doing a press fit. If the bone's a little soft, we might have to protect that patient with a little uh, touchdown weight bearing a little longer than, let's say, someone like my guy, where I'd probably I'd let him bear weight uh, fully at about uh, three to four, I think it was like three or four weeks. And uh, age, I mean, age really goes along with bone quality for the most part in my mind. And then also the associated health factors. You know, remember, this is a fusion operation. There's a biology going on here. It's not just sticking a piece of metal. The metal, there's a biology going on. So are they diabetic? Are they, you know, do they have, are they a horrible smoker, which, you know, all things can slow down? Are they on chronic steroids? So you don't say associated health factors. You know, you have to take these things in consideration when you start bearing weight. And I will be honest, occasionally in my certain, my certain, my, like my rotator cuff, I do don't, I don't send them to you folks to about three weeks. I try to protect them from you in your zeal to help. I, you know, just, uh, I, but I say just, you know, I get them, I get them, I do them their condiments and I have them do their wall crawls and reach behinds. Uh, and then about week three, I say, go, now go to the therapist. Um, 
But just so you know, the rotator cuff is weakest at week three, by the way. It's not, not it's interesting. You think it'd just be stronger each week, but it's the weakest at week three. But uh, so you want to take in the patient uh, considerations and then and have a conversation with surgeon. That's really another bullet point I would take home from here. You know, talk to, talk to the doctor. Ha um, by the way, if I could editorialize, put, so put a recommendation on your report. Sometimes folks are a little skittish about putting a recommendation. I think this patient could have more therapy. I don't think therapy is helping at this point. It's okay to do that. We may or may not agree. Um, but it's, it, it's so much more helpful. As I always say, you folks see the patients two, three times a week. We see them once every four, six, eight weeks, okay? You are with them day in, day out. And it's nice to have two perspectives, right? A camera versus a movie. Uh, we get to see snapshots in time, and you see them every day. But put a recommendation. I mean, what's worst we're going to say? No, I, I think the patient will have, I think we're just going to get an FCE. We're just going to, you know, go ahead and add weights or go ahead and get general. 90% of the time you put a recommendation, I promise you we're signing off on it because we trust what you say. But don't be afraid to put it, okay? I put a recommendation. So talk. If you're not sure, call, it, really. And, and even most of us have PAs or, or a trusted nurse uh, or even just an office person who's just been with us for long enough. Uh, you might, if we're, we're busy, they could usually uh, assist you as well. So that's my editorial uh, comment. Um, so this, so the, the one nice thing again, the company is very, very uh, didactic. They have, they provide the patient with a booklet. Uh, they, you'll see, there's actually picture uh, exercises. So assist you, and that's what that's what's really important. So the surgeon can write on this right in the post-op area. Boom, boom, boom. This goes home with the patient. We tell the patient, so I, I do. Tell them bring it to your therapist. There's exercises. He even says how many times per day to do it. Uh, it gives you, uh, so you know exactly, so you don't feel like you're in the dark, because communication is key. And yes, we can't always be on the phone with each other every day. You have your patient load, we have ours. Uh, but at the same time, so this, this is just a nice way to communicate, so you could feel you're, do, you're confident in what you're doing, because patients can sense when you're not confident with what you're doing. They can't. Um, Again, yeah, same thing. But the patient should have this with them. Uh, this is just show, uh, what this slide really is just showing is log rolling, right? I mean, this is this is fine fusion. You want to avoid twisting. Uh, that's the key, right? Just to, to your point. While we have good fixation, don't test it. You know, try to do the best we can to mobilize it. But bracing the sacroiliac joint, like with a, like a, uh, what are those? Uh, hip knee angle. Uh, I'm blanking on it now. For the hip dislocations. Anyway, the very very they, they don't work. They don't Newport, work. Yeah, Newport, what? Newport, Newport, oh, Newport. I haven't even heard that term. I just yeah. uh, so I learned something tonight. Uh, so the considerations is just basically remember that they these patients have been in pain. Now the younger my younger guy, yeah, he's been in pain, but he, I'm not gonna say he's super deconditioned. I mean, he wasn't ready to go lift 70 pounds. But then uh, a lot of older folks have sacroiliac issues who may be you know if they have a problem and they meet the criteria, there's no reason to withhold the surgery from them. Uh, so again, just have to take each patient in some special considerations. Just remember it's a fusion. You want to s slow the motion, you know, you know, log roll so you don't have the motion. Try to uh, let the biology work. And if they have cons uh, considerations where the biology will slow that fusion, uh, you know, be a little more gentle with them versus the young one with rock hard bone, you probably go a little faster. So this is just kind of a summary of what they were saying. You want to take over? Yeah. All right. Can I ask a question? So like yeah. the, the patient's population that you say that you have to pick the right training patient, can you talk about a little bit about the specific the patient, like the age, the mechanism of injury? Is it actually a ligament tear that you fuse it? Or what kind of patient that in the population that you fit in this kind of fusion? With the patient is what he talked about the physical exam. It, it's, it's all of those potentially. Okay. So it doesn't matter. Is it a history of injury? It could be Correct. As well infectious, as you wouldn't. Right. Post infectious, you would. But, like, let's say one thing I saw in his slide, you wouldn't put the implants into a fresh infection. I know they did, they did a lot of that actually with the tuberculosis crowd in, the, in the Asia uh, back in the, in the day. In fact, Dr. Rondewald trained me at Russian Spine Fusion, and in the 60s, he went to Asia to learn scoliosis surgery because they had such a population. So um, and that was one of the re few times, like one of the exceptions, if you will, where you'd put hardware or you know, uh, implants into an active infectionary. But again, it was tuberculosis. It wasn't, say, a staph infection. 
So that was one slide I saw. But it, it, let's say someone had been cured of the infection, but they had the, the joint was now scarred down and it was post-infectious arthritis. That would be one. But really, it's they it's it's the, think of the surgery is uh, more. We already we know we were trying to eliminate the pain from this joint. I guess what I would take what I would say to you is just really more the focus of this talk is uh, be more aware of the sacroiliac joint as a, a potential source of pain for any and all of those and, for, and a few more. And if you know do what you can, and the injectionists will do what they can, and the medications will do what they can. And if that fails, then there is surgery for it. I guess that would be the bullet take home point. Uh, if for really for you is just be more aware of this so it could be all those. You wouldn't say, oh, this was a ligamentous tear of the sacral joint. They have painful sacral joint and the injections, you know, like he said, uh, the, the finger fortin was there, the injection showed, uh, but, um, yeah. but we're not going to do the surgery because he was a ligamentous tear and not just a root arthritic thing or a transfer from a spinal fusion. Yes, ma'am. You mean, oh, that's what that's what they are. That's probably the biggest population we're seeing. So, in yeah. your practice, how what percentage? Oh, I don't know. That's high. Very yeah. high. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. I mean, I have a few older ladies. I have two pa two patient populations. I have the lumbar fusion patients and the little old ladies. Okay, so if you put <laughs> <little> old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they are. So I don't have like a thirty-five year old guy who just as my sacral joint hurts. And how long do you have to wait? The little old lady? No, the, the one about two years. Two years. Two years. Two, I, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I'm following your question. So a lot of the patients you see are, are lumbar fusions that have... Well, right, they, they failed everything. They, they said it didn't, the su for surgery didn't help. Oh, you mean after the fusion, is that what you're asking? Oh, I, I don't know, it's, it's months. Because first of all, it takes them about yeah months to you know a year. I mean, this guy, yeah, because they, the first, because everything at first is, oh, it's just the post-op pain. You're gonna get over it. Oh, I yeah. didn't think I yeah. You see people for this kind of procedure after they've had fusions. I was right, wondering right. how long. From the fusion to, to yeah. the sacral to the sacral like pain. That's why no, I, I was answering before that. Before you actually. Yeah, because I mean, when they're right. having pain, you know, remember the pain. There's an overlay of pain. That's what the whole so point the of his, didn't his work slides. And that's right. Yeah, oh, it feels all, oh, you know, and remember, most, again, forgotten joint. People write this off. Oh, he's a work cop. He just has pain because the, fu the fusion should have helped him, but he's a work cop. Yeah. Oh, the fusion didn't help him, be, you know, it's, it blame the patient, right? That's what we did with vertebral compression fracture. We did with other things. So, uh-oh, I think we have to go. Oh, no, excuse me. So yeah. we can, we're going to take more questions at the end, but so we can continue. But I'll stay as long as you want. With the presentation, we're going to kind of try to hold off questions until yeah. the end. Unless okay, you're trying to miss. I know those in virtual have questions as well, and you'll be more than welcome to answer your questions too. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'll stay. I'll take it. I know what you're asking. So, so I had, you know, wondering whether you had any questions. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to go back to one slide here, I think. Just because I like this slide. <laughs> I think this was interesting. So here you have all these different studies, and this is their visual analog scale before the surgery and then after the surgery. But what I wanted to know, I was interested, because this is when some of the five and six year data came out, I thought, Okay, so, so how good is this technique? Is it going to be just like a lumbar fusion where these people are going to start to have pain again down the road because of adjacent segment degeneration? Majority of these patients started at pain levels of <coughs> 7, 8, 9, and 3 to 6 months after the surgery, they're down to 2, and 3, and 4. But here's the thing. 12 months, 24, 36, 48, and 60. It's still down. Uh, I think that's pretty interesting that after four and five and six years, you're still seeing these people with decreased pain levels. Uh, just to kind of to highlight that a little bit. Um, uh, yes, like Dr. Hennessy said, we do have a, a brochure to kind of help you if you work inpatient. I know I work inpatient on some of the weekends. We get these people up just like any other lumbar fusion type problem. Um, you have them doing transverse abdominal contractions and, and core stabilization that first day. Um, they're toe-touch weight-bearing for about two weeks, okay? Um, 
not because they're going to be in so much pain, but actually because they're not in so much pain. Um, that we're scared that they might actually hurt themselves when they start walking. That sometimes, you know, these are people that are sometimes pretty debilitated, and they go and walk, but you know, they've had such a, an atrophy glute or problems for so long, and they just go and walk. They're just not safe doing it. So we start them off with a walker and toe touch weight bearing for two for two weeks. Um, and it's not that we're scared about the implant. We've actually never ever had an implant break at all. They're pretty solid in there. Um, and the patient is gradually weaned from toe touch weight bearing. And then from an outpatient standpoint, we treat them like anybody else with a lumbar fusion. But I think we pay a little bit more attention to the kinetic chain and problems lower down the, down the chain just because of we have the transfer of load from the sacroiliac joint. But many times these people go back to work, like Dr. Hennessy said, they go back to running marathons and, and everything like that too. So um, not to say everybody does, but we do have people that do that. So what I think we'll do now, uh, we're going to quickly go over some of the, the provocation tests because it's one thing to show you what they are, but it's another thing to actually do it so you understand it a little bit more. So. You should also have a handout that shows each of the testing. We'll just do it here, right? Do you want them to? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first one's the distraction test. Um, what you're doing with the patient supine, if you'd lie down there for me. And I'm gonna have you scoot towards me as much as you can over this way. So what you're doing, through the ASIS, you're directing a posterior lateral force, okay? You gotta make sure that your hands are soft because this area is kinda of sensitive to begin with. Um, and you just kinda of let your hands kinda of conform to their body there. And what you do is a posterior lateral force, slowly, 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 and you always wanna watch their face, okay? Because as you know, you can say something to the patient, but their face really tells the story. If this is a positive test, it's gonna cause them pain, but it's gotta be in a specific location. Remember the Fortin finger test? If this is positive for SI joint pain, it's gonna cause them pain right at the PSIS, okay? So a so, slow, gradual increased force. Press, 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 and if this was a positive test, she'd say, ouch. ouch. <laughs> Where does that bother you? Right there, is that your typical pain? Yes. That's a positive test. Uh, they recommend holding it for up to 20, 30 seconds if you need to, just because of the creep, creep deformation. Um, but really, you're going to know after 5, 10 seconds if this is positive or not. Um, as you slowly increase the force, if it's positive, they're gonna, you're going to see it. Okay? You want them as close to you as you can so that you don't hurt yourself. And just, again, slow, gradual, increased force. Because if you go too fast, too hard, even if it's not positive, it's going to cause them pain. Okay? Beth, can you comment on how much pressure you're putting on the SI? Um, I mean, how, is it a moderate amount, a lot? I go from basically nothing to adding quite a bit. Um, but you, like I said, before you get to that point where it's going to do any damage, you're going to know and you're not going to get to that point too. So, um, okay. So the next one we're going to go over is the thigh thrust test. So for here, what you're going to do is raise the hip up to 90 degrees. And what you do is put a posterior directed force right through the hip. So what happens is you have kind of shearing of the ilium on the sacrum, okay? And you want all the force to go through the SI joint. So what you actually have to do is stabilize the other side. Because if I don't, you get rocking of the pelvis on the other side. So all that force gets distributed throughout the whole complex. So what you do is you stabilize the contralateral side. And we think that we're affecting this right side right here more, okay? This is why you want the patient as close to you as possible because what you're going to do is you're actually going to put your weight right down through their leg, okay? If you're shorter or if the patient's over here, you're not going to be able to generate enough force. Here, you can just kind of be lazy with it and you just kind of let your body sink down, okay? So you stabilize the contralateral side and slowly lower your force on the hip. If it's a positive test, she's going to say, ouch. ouch. Where does that hurt you? Right. right at the PSIS. And you want to know that because people have weird pain, right? It hurts this person in their big toe or up by their shoulder blade or everything like that. You want to make sure it's right at the PSIS for a positive test, okay? Can anybody tell me one patient population that you would not want to do this test with? Say that louder. Like a hip joint replacement with posterior precautions, right? You're not going to do this, right? Um, 
not every test is designed for every person, okay? But that's why we have five different tests that you can pick and choose from. All you need is three positive tests, okay? So you can do that, yeah. Uh, so you're taught differently to put the hand under the under the sacrum to do it that way. To feel the movement, yeah. You can do that. Um, SI bone has taken a stance, and we don't. Therapists are pretty comfortable with their patients all the time, but we have more than just therapists doing these tests. Uh, sometimes other practitioners that aren't as comfortable with that. So from a medical legal standpoint, it was just easier not to put the hand under the sacrum and to do it this way. But that's definitely yes, you can definitely do that. Okay. Um, Okay, so the next is the Faber test, standing for flexion, abduction, and external rotation, okay? So you're gonna bring up the leg, you're gonna put the ankle just above the knee, again, you're gonna stabilize the contralateral side, and you're gonna let this knee fall into flexion, abduction, and external rotation, okay? Again, you're watching the patient's face, because if it's painful or it's positive, she's gonna complain of pain right at the, the SIS. The reason this is a good test, because like I said, if they have pain in the low back, you're going to look more into the low back. Anterior hip, look more into the hip area as well, okay? Another thing I like about it, you can tell just the general flexibility and mobility of that patient's hip by doing this. If they're up here, they got pretty tight rotators, right? Or maybe your, your female athlete that's very, very flexible, maybe you give them just a little bit of overpressure because they have quite a bit of flexibility to begin with. The next one we're going to do the compression test, okay? So just like the distraction test, what we did was we gapped the anterior part of the joint and compressed the posterior part of the joint. Here we're doing the opposite. Now we're compressing the anterior part of the joint. You can't always say, yes, I'm stressing or, you know, the anterior SI joint ligaments are inflamed or painful. We don't always know that for sure. Even though that's kind of what we're doing, we can't assume that. We just know that these tests show us that if it's a sacroiliac joint problem or not, okay? So with this, we think we're affecting the top side more. Although in this position, you have to affect both of them to some extent, right? So then you want the patient as close to you as you can. You're gonna put a pressure just between the uh, greater trochanter and the ASIS, right in there. Again, you wanna just relax your hand because this isn't a very comfortable position for them or, or spot for them. So you put your body weight right over the top and you slowly lower right over that area. So if it was positive again, right at the PSIS, make sure they're not having pain where your pressure is or anything like that. And they could have pain on both sides too. We've all seen people with, people with uh, SI joint problems on both sides. So you can test both sides if you like to as well. Okay, okay for that test and uh, supine as well? Then. You know, I was taught to do the distraction test in supine, uh, like you said. Um, but the research shows it in sideline. Yeah. And as I, th I think about it, it actually makes sense because with that one, and you so can't generate enough more. force doing it this yeah. way when they're supine. But if you just lower your body weight over them, it's a lot better and you can generate enough force that's needed so you don't get a false negative and test. Especially with size mismatch. Exactly, exactly. Okay. The last one is the gain silence test, which um, is kind of like a glorified hip flexor test. Um, I don't like this one as much. It's kind of like my number five. Um, but sometimes... Sometimes you may not even get to this test. Sometimes you already know before you get to this if you've had three positive or it's, it's not the problem. Uh, but it does give us good, valuable information. It has shown to be in the literature to be appropriate. And also you can take a look at their hip flexors as well. Because uh, who here doesn't have any patients with tight hip flexors, right? Okay, so you're going to have her as close to you as you can. Again, we think we're affecting this right side here or the side that's coming off the side. But again, you have to affect both sides to some extent. So what we want to do is... Um, Okay, so we're going to pre-tension the contralateral side. So I'm going to have her hold up her left leg to take that ilium and put it into posterior rotation. Okay, so now all the slack is taken up. We're going to take this right side, bring it off the side of the table, and put that ilium into anterior rotation to put more torque through the sacroiliac joint. Okay, again, you got to watch your patient because when your hip flexors are tight or this is irritated, it's very, very painful, right? So you're slowly going to lower them down. Again, if that's painful on the right side, she's going to complain of pain right at the PSIS. Um, 
your patient might not even get this far. So make sure you know where the pain is at. If they have pain anteriorly, it might be the hip joint. It might be tight hip flexors, so something to that extent, okay? Um, in, in my examination, I usually perform the compression test last because they have to go under their side. It's easier just to perform everything in this position as well as other range of motion and other um, straight leg raise or anything else you do in that position. Um, but if you do it a couple times, it only probably takes about a minute or two to perform all of these at most, okay? And you can either rule in or rule out the sacroiliac joint by those, okay? Um, I'll bring Dr. Hennessy back here, and uh, we will answer any questions that you guys have. Can you put some implants in her mouth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after that, I do have a surgery. Well, since the fuse, most of them have already had problems with lumbar spine, and such as a spinal fusion, yes. Uh, the other side usually have some symptom, uh, but uh, but no, it's it's the bilaterality is actually it's not as as, as there's some symptom, but not I haven't found the bilaterality to be as strong yet. Uh, I don't know the percentage of these because um, I'm not a surgeon, of course. But sometimes what what some of the research is showing is that also. Um, many times if you have bilateral symptoms, sometimes people come in for the second side later on, but sometimes it actually gets rid of some of the contralateral pain. Why? We don't know for sure. It could be that you're actually providing stability for the whole area because uh, it works as a system. You know, sometimes you, know, you would think, oh, well, if you fuse this side, this side's going to end up with pain. It doesn't always happen. That way. Uh, but I think that's an area for further research as well. Do you find that in clinical practice? I haven't found bilateral. Bilateral? Oh. So most of your caseload is pre-lumbar fusion? Post-lumbar fusion. After lumbar fusion. Right. They had a previous lumbar fusion. Mm -hmm. So if you could go back in time. I think this is my first question. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> has to come back to the lumbar joint or go to the SI. Um, so what alternative procedures would you think in those patients so that they don't end up later on on, on, a, so you're on saying SI the, fusions? So, so you're saying, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to hear your question again. I will repeat your question to see if I understand it. So this is not the, not the population who's already had a fusion, correct? We're talking about someone who has back pain? I'm just saying, if you could turn back the clock when you made these decisions about lumbar fusion, um, I know that in Europe they're looking for alternative um, procedures rather than fusion because they're seeing the problems mm -hmm. later on. Um, in your experience as a surgeon, would you choose to do something else with a lot of those lumbar fusions? Are you talking about disc replacement, or are you talking about, are you, or are you driving yeah. at, okay, well, number one, disc replacement so far has, the, 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 the data is very mixed. The, the theory is, is that if you still have motion at that segment, you prevent the adjacent level disease. And I, recently there's been a little, a few, a, a few spate of papers that have been positive towards that, but to date, the official position of the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons is the data doesn't support that. that that's the theory, but it isn't supported yet. There, it's, there seem to be some papers that be, are moving towards it, so I hope that answers that yes. question. Okay, then number two, if I, thought, I, I thought maybe, and I thought maybe you were going there as well, are we actually doing lumbar fusion on patients who are actually, the primary problem was originally sacroiliac? Probably not. Um, because, the, 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 again, this is a smaller population. There's less motion than the lumbar spine. So the, while there probably are some that really, uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, 
Well, there probably are some that got a lump, let's say got a lumbar fusion, and their primary problem was actually the sacroiliac joint. I, I would probably say that number is pretty low. I wouldn't say I, this. This is not going to replace lumbar fusion problems. I hope that answered it. No, the first. One. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> I, I knew it was one of those two questions. Um, we have a question from online. How common is it for persons age 65 or older to have new onset SI dysfunction? What? You've seen before, I <laughs> Sometimes. Um, okay, so how common is it somebody older than 65 to have a new onset of sacroiliac joint pain? Um, I think it depends. There's some research out there that shows that as we age, that sometimes the joint does naturally fuse. It's not as common as we actually thought it was, but in some patients it does. Um, so I think from that standpoint, we don't see that group as much. Um, but I do see people with pain in, in that time. Uh, plus, let's say maybe in their 50s or 40s, they had a, a lumbar fusion. That can predispose them for sacroiliac joint problems later down the road as well. Uh, but how often, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, but I do see people with new onset after the age of 65. Would you agree with that? I would, I would say, um, so, similar to what I said in the, in the uh, previous part of the talk, it's the forgotten joint. Is there, is this, are 20, like 25, 30% of lumbar pain patients are actually SI? No. Uh, but there are, there are patients, that, that the purpose of the talk is sort of to, you know, just to reawaken everyone to keep it a more, more close eye on sacral -like joint as a possible problem, particularly when, when things aren't going well. Right? You're, you're, you're treating, if they're going well, there's no reason to investigate further, right? But if there isn't, if things aren't going well, perhaps you have to rethink your diagnosis. And I guess that's what I would probably have as a take home point. So can they have it? You bet they can. And it's, an, it's a joint, it does have some motion, it can become arthritic as we get older, so certainly can cause pain. And remember, it was considered a significant source of pain, you know, a century, a century ago. And it wasn't like that they were stupid. I mean, they were good doctors or good therapists. Well, I don't know if there was formal therapy existed, to be honest. So, but the, uh, but they, you know, they, doc they were doing their best, and they were treating and getting good results. And I mean, we have some better things today. But just because we forgot it, we shouldn't look back and say they were, they were stupid. The point of the talk is to reawaken the, uh, the awareness of the sacral joint and that there are things to do, including up to surgery. Um, in the early years of my career, I had debates with some orthopedic surgeons um, who refused to give me orders to treat the sacroiliac joint and was told by a couple of them that the sacroiliac joint only moves in women during childbirth. Um, and again, I'm going back a number of years and maybe some of these were surgeons that were taught that a number of years even before that. When did it become pretty common agreement in the orthopedic community of the orthopedic doctors and surgeons that yes this is, is indeed a joint that does indeed move and yes we indeed do need to treat it. Oh, we're much uh, we're much more open-minded than our forefathers. <laughs> uh, but in some respects we really are. I mean I'll, I'll be honest with you uh, because remember we only we, we start our training and what we start with we think has been going on. I started in the physical therapy era. There, was a, there were surgeons, like, as I went out, because Rush, when, one unique part of training at Rush, when I, at least when I was there, is we actually trained in a lot of different places. We went to Christ, we had to go to County. <laughs> um, we, had, we, we went to, but even more so in the medical school, we went out into like Rush Copley, went to McNeil, I went to the old Grant Hospital up in uh, Waukegan. Um, we were all over the place. We didn't like versus like North, Northwestern stayed a little bit more at Northwestern. Um, so uh, you got to see, but the, uh, you got exposed to a lot of different thought, and uh, and there were there there were there were orthopedic surgeons who you know you don't need therapy. It's just a waste of time. I don't think you. I mean, no, we we, we we're, we're fighting over whether we get to whether you guys can treat without us or not you know, in, in, the state, in the state legislature. But the point being is, is, I don't think you'll find a single orthopedic surgeon who says that anymore. Um, and, and kind of along the lines of this, that, you know, bring it back to the sacral injury. So when did it become common? I mean, you'll probably have a lot of spine surgeons say, well, I, you know, they're just so busy doing what they do and they like doing just what they do. Um, but, well, I don't really see that much. Because if you don't look, you won't find it. Um, so I wouldn't say that's... I would say, I would actually take your question and say, it's not all that common yet. But neither was therapy 25, 30 years ago. 
and uh, neither was, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of things we do now, you know, orthopedics, all of medicine. That they once said, right, I mean, if you had a heart attack in the 60s, what did they do? They okay. shut the... They shut the blinds, they pulled the phone, took the TV out because they intuitively had a rest. We don't do that anymore, right? We get them moving right away. Right? Mm -hmm. Can I answer your question? I think the correct oh. answer is November 21st, 1963. <laughs> Say again? Say? I think the correct answer is November 21st, 1963. Yeah, exactly. You know, we, yeah, we, we have enough research nowadays to show that this, oh, this I, is happening. I had research um, then too, but, uh, yeah, but, I think things have evolved a lot since that time. Yes. A paradigm shift. Some, yeah, a paradigm shift within a worker. Well, there, it's, it's shifting. You're, in the, you're seeing the shift. Oh. Is that, I think that's a better way to phrase it. It, it wasn't one sentinel moment. You're in the middle of it. It's, this company's been doing this for a decade. It's really, you're just starting to see it pick up. Mm -hmm. Is there any Sorry. issue with the gluteal muscles? The, uh, I saw the, the model there, gluteus minimus, MR medius, excuse me. Uh, are, you, are you just gently splitting it and going through, or is that gently? <laughs> <laughs> You're a carpenter, I understand. Yeah. But, uh, no. I, you know, I, I see a lot of glute, glute knee issues. I do a lot of hip uh, therapy, so I was sure. wondering patients who have that who have these very delicate as that muscle comes back and loaded more more fragile. Well, it, it's more of a split. Remember, yeah. we start with a, 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 a KY. Well, right. it's, it's a, a Steinman pin, really, but we start with a, p a pin. When we say pin, though, it's really just think of um, think of a very th a spike about the size of a, of a standard screw, but it's smooth, yeah. and you and you you uh, so you're just going right through the muscle. Yeah. It's a sharp bone right through the uh, the muscle, and then the dilator is is uh, beveled on the cone to go over it, and it put, so it docks, yeah. so it, sp it spreads the muscle. I mean, are you killing a few fibers? Yes, but this is not a distraction. There is no re retractor. That where you're retracting the whole muscle group. I hope that answers your question. So the glute knee function is a pretty decent answer. Yes. Yeah, I mean they're they're sore because you just drilled it. I'm trying to six months after surgery. Oh no, no, yeah. uh, no. I mean it's a, the soft tissue damage is minimal. There are other procedures. There are other those companies where it is an open procedure to the sacroiliac posteriorly. This actually goes right through the side. Yeah. Do you have time for one more question? Oh, yeah. So, um, I mean, I really like the idea of how that the pain control the studies show that how it was like very high pain level, it goes down. And then you also have a slide that shows there's a lot of different procedures going on, and only this one, the SI bone, actually has a lot of evidence based RCT support on that. But as a commoner, like general patient population, healthcare consumer, they don't know. I mean, how do they, I mean, how, how many doctors are trained in this procedure, or how can people find it? One, I mean, there are other procedures, but how do people choose it, and how do they know that's a better one? Well, I would say that in my practice, the reality is, is most patients don't. Most patients don't come in and say, "I want an SI bone. I don't wait, want wait, the wait, other wait, one." Wait, wait. I mean, one <laughs> some, no, but it's, no, but like, once, no, once in a blue moon, someone comes in with joint replacement in well, that regard. But as far you know, like they say, mm -hmm. "I want, I, I want the uh, Jack Nicholas knee." That, that was popular for a while when he was advertising the Oxygen knee. Um, uh, but but the reality is, is most don't. So the other thing to consider, though, also is it's not just the company, but the um, the surgeon's comfort with the the, the, the uh, tools. Mm -hmm. And I and this is like you know I, this in my administrative duties when I was uh, chairman. This is one of the things that's it's hard to get across to the bean counters in the hospital because you know they again using more joint replacement um, as an example. We just dealt with that predominantly. Uh, you know, to them a joint was a joint was a joint. And it was hard for them to understand that, you know, Dr. Jones has been using, well, I'll use, I don't want to use real company's name, I guess, but uh, since we're on camera. But uh, it was used, <laughs> using um, Acme hip replacements, and so-and-so was using uh, better value hip replacements, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, whatever, I'm just saying. But, uh, but the point being is that, that maybe that person trained on better value. And so it wasn't just the <clears throat> implant. It's the most... You get, you do get to a point sometimes. Not, not like SI is so that's not the case. Yeah. But
But let's, I'm going to be real honest with you. Most of our replacements are pretty much along major five, six companies. There's not really any great data that one's a lot better than the other. So it's really the hands of the surgeon. So if there's a little problem, they know the nuances of the tools and what tools are available and the, and the components, like what to avoid, the pitfalls to avoid. There are nuance differences. Um, so that sometimes they, they don't take that. So as far as, so if you were, let's say you wanted to be a real proactive consumer, be a little wary about forcing your surgeon to use something that they don't use off all the time as well. I mean, just keep that in mind. I can tell you, I can tell you that like if someone came in, I, I had to put in, uh, well, this is it, as I said already, Oxy me because she had, a, she had a documented nickel allergy. It was one of the only knee replacements that had no nickel um, in it. And so, uh, you know, it's different. I was, it was you know, it's, I mean, she's doing great. I actually put the second one in like years later. She came years later for the second side. But, and she was like, the only, she's the two of that brand. She is the two. She has left and right, and she is the two of that brand. But I wouldn't do it on a routine basis. Not that they, she didn't do well. It's just that I, the brands, I, the two brands that I typically use, I know them inside now. If there's a little problem, I know how to get out of the problem, you know, versus the other one I may not. Do you okay. Um, I, we just need to double check. We have to be aware of time. Was there any questions out there in virtual land? No. Any questions? Okay, so I think what we're going to do is thank you so much, Dr. Ryan and Scott. Uh, we really, uh, IPTA really appreciates your time and effort. And what we'll do is we'll sign off from virtual since there's no further questions. Your con both of your contact information is in the presentation if anyone wants to reach out to you. And then you folks that are here present live, as Dr. Ryan said, they're sticking around. So feel free to ask your questions, okay? Thank you so much.